Okay, folks. A couple, uh, couple of things I need to draw your attention to. One is your quizzes are upstairs if you want to pick them up. I'll tell you, in theory, I'm supposed to keep your quizzes for a year, but I won't. They'll go to recycling sometime later this semester. I just don't have the room to kind of accumulate the quizzes. So if you want them, come and take them. If you don't, I really don't care, right? I mean, it's you know, you have the score already, and if you feel your score is enough, you don't need to pick up the quiz. But if you do feel that you need to check the quiz to make sure that you haven't been, you know, that some points that you should have got, no, you didn't get. And if you do find a mistake on the grading, the best way to deal with it, I think, is given that physical office hours still seem to be this hazy space. I'm not sure what it's supposed to be. Let's take a picture of the page with the mistake, send it to me, and I will fix it as soon as I can. Second, you know that uh, next week is spring break, so we won't have class next week. But the case was made available yesterday. I sent an email out, so if you haven't seen that email, check the email. If you don't care about the email, go to the web page for the class, click on the case. If nothing else, just download the damn thing before spring break, right? You know, even if you don't plan to read it, just download it. My suggestion is that you at least read it to get a sense of what you need to do. Uh, let it kind of fester, probably the wrong word to use. No, let it, let it marinate in your mind for 10 days if need be until you come back from spring break. But it's due before class. Let me emphasize that, before class on March 30th. Why before class? Because during class, we're going to talk about you know, how, you know, what, what, what the case analysis should look like. I'm going to give you my assessment of the case. It doesn't mean it is the assessment, but I need the the cases turned in before that. It is a group project, so you turn in one case per group. Okay? So remember who's in your group. You might never have met yet. You just have a group. No, but this is the time that at least, you know, and I don't think physically you need to get together as a group. At least you need to work together virtually to get a sense of who's doing what on the case. Any questions before we begin? Okay. So today we're going to complete the discussion of cost to capital. Cost of equity, we said you need a risk-free rate based on whatever currency you're doing the analysis in, a beta that reflects the business mix you're in, and an equity risk premium that reflects where you do business. And then for the cost of debt, we said you need a rate at which you can borrow money long term today. That was the starting point. So how do we get that? We took the easy road first. If you have a company with a bond rating, to the extent that you trust the ratings agency, you have an assessment of default risk, you can take that rating to come up with a default spread based on the rating. After class today, when I send an email, I'm, I actually put together a little video on how to use Bloomberg to get the most updated corporate default spreads. It's a little tricky because you know, you got to hit a couple of defaults to do it, but it's neat because it'll give you current default spreads by corporate bonds for different maturities. So if you have a rating, and we had three companies for which I had ratings, I took the ratings, came up with the default spreads based on those ratings, and added those default spreads to my risk-free rate to get to a cost of debt, pre-tax. But what if your company does not have a rating? You're saying, how do I know whether my company has a rating? Just to go to Google search, incredibly powerful tool right there, and say, put in the name of your company and put in bond rating. If your company has a rating, you probably see at least a couple of news stories on what the rating is for your company. But if your company doesn't have a rating, I talked about how I was going to do it. I said, I'm going to act like a ratings agency and put a rating on the company, a synthetic rating. Synthetic because it's a rating that I'm concocting. And the ratio I said I was going to use is the interest coverage ratio. The interest coverage ratio is just earnings before interest and taxes. I prefer to use operating income because to me that generically captures what you're making from your operating assets, divided by interest expense. Now first, if you ask me, you know, I told you why I picked the ratio. It's not because I think it's the best ratio or the ratio that I most believe in. I'm completely agnostic. I'd have picked any of the eight ratios S&P claimed to use, but this was the ratio that best explained differences in ratings across companies, and I want to kind of replicate what ratings agencies do. Now, as a lender to a company, you want this ratio to be as high as possible, right? You want to get a buffer. 
So here's what I did. I computed the interest coverage ratio for my five companies, including the three that have ratings. I wanted to see what kind of rating I would give these companies using my synthetic ratings process and then compare it to the actual rating. So if you look across the companies, at least in 2013, Baidu, just purely based on the interest coverage ratio, would have been the safest company to lend to. And the reason is that almost no debt. It's a tech company, but it, so keep that in mind. Many of your companies, if they're very little debt, especially if they're money-making companies, you're gonna get interest coverage ratios go through the ceiling, simply because they don't have very much in interest expenses. Next highest was Disney, then Vale, then Tata Motors, and Bookscape. So purely based on the interest coverage ratios, the riskiest company to lend to would be Tata Motors, the safest company would be Baidu. So here's my task. I've got to convert these interest coverage ratios into ratings. Why? Not because I care about ratings, but because ratings give me a way of getting default spreads. So I have a lookup table. It's a lookup table that I've had for about 30 years. I tweak it, I update it each year. And basically what this lookup table allows me to do is if you give me the interest coverage ratio for a company, I'll take that interest coverage ratio and say this is what the rating will look like for your company based just on the interest coverage ratio. You'll notice there are two sets of numbers. One for big companies, and I define big in terms of market cap, more than five billion, one for small companies. Why? Because life's not fair. If you're a big company, you get a better rating for a given interest coverage ratio than if you're a small company. Too big to fail plays out in ratings as well, that your ratings reflect the size of the company. So let's take Disney, large market cap company. So I'm gonna to go to the first column. Interest coverage ratio of 22.57. This is a slam dunk, no? higher than my highest number. So if I were giving them a synthetic rating, it would be AAA. You take Vale, it's a large market cap company, but it's an emerging market company. And with emerging market companies, I just go down to the small cap risky company column, because emerging market companies, even if they're big, never seem to qualify for that special treatment. 11.67 interest coverage ratio, that puts me right there, double A rating. Tata Motors, large market cap, but still emerging market, 4.51. Well, they barely make the A minus rating, because if you can see the cutoff, they're just above 4.5, so I give them an A minus rating. But they're just above the triple B. Baidu, small cap, because the market cap was less than 5 billion at that time. 23.72, triple A rating. And finally, Bookscape, private business. I mean, I shouldn't even put a small cap there because clearly it's worth a couple of million at best. Based on 5.16 interest coverage ratio, its rating is A minus. I've taken the interest coverage ratios and then based on the market cap, decided which portion of the lookup table to look at and come up with a rating for each company. Yes? Remember those companies I started with the actual rated companies and I put the eight ratios in? And then I said I did some, some reverse engineering there? Once I had the AAA, AA, I could see the spread of interest coverage ratios within each ratings class. Of course, you don't get the clean spreads that I get there, but then I had to create some kind of cutoff between AAA and AA. So this is purely based on how I saw the ratings agencies rate companies. That's why I said there's no theory here. It's completely agnostic. It's based on looking at how ratings agencies rate companies. So I have a synthetic rating for all five of my companies, but three of them have actual ratings. So I was a little curious about how close you'd get. So I'm gonna compare my actual ratings to my synthetic ratings. So let's take Disney. My synthetic rating is triple A. The actual rating was single A. So clearly I'm overrating the company. And there's a good reason for that. When ratings agencies rate companies, they don't just look at last year's income. They're pretty sensible. They look at rate income over time. And when I looked at Disney in 2013, they were coming off a really good year. There's an easy fix for this, right? If I'm worried that the most recent year is going to give me a strange rating, especially if it's a year like 2020, or if commodity price for oil companies 2022 is going to be a great year in terms of earnings. A simple fix is to do an interest coverage ratio by looking at average operating income over time. If I did that, 
then I get closer to the single A. But basically, I can explain that difference by saying, look, I'm overrating the company. I know I'm overrating the company, but here I'm going to go with the single A rating because it reflects more what the company can make in a normal year. For Vale, my synthetic rating was double A. The actual rating was A minus. And here I think there's a much simpler reason for the difference. Vale was actually having, having a, no, not, didn't have a great year in 2013. I still gave it a double A rating. But Vale is a Brazilian company. Remember what we talked about when, when you think about default risk in a company, that the default risk in a company can be affected by the country in which it's in? And in the case of Vale, because it's a Brazilian company, I think I am, I'm overrating the company because I'm not bringing in the fact that it's an emerging market company. You will consistently find that my synthetic ratings process gives you higher ratings for emerging market companies because I'm not factoring country risk. But it's easy to bring that in, right, separately? Because if you think about country risk as an extra factor, we have a country default spread you can add on. And finally, for Deutsche, at a single A rating, you're saying, why don't you compute an interest coverage ratio for Deutsche? Remember what we said about banks? I have no idea what debt is. I don't even know what, to, what interest expense would be. Record no. Recording in progress. Did I forget to hit the recording button? It's been in progress for a while, so hopefully it's good. So basically, for the three companies where I had an actual rating, I can see the synthetic ratings are different, but it doesn't bother me in the least. And I'll explain why it doesn't bother me in the least. This is an input into my cost of capital, right? Many of these companies have 10% debt ratios, 15% debt ratios. So let's say I'd use the synthetic rating for Vale to get the cost of debt, come up with the cost of capital. My cost of capital is going to change by like 0.1%. I'm not a fixed income person. I don't want to get a perfect rating. I just want an approximation. So when people say, your synthetic ratings process is going to give me the wrong rating, I say, I'm okay with that as long as I'm within shouting distance of the truth. Within two notches, even three notches, I'm going to be okay because I'm getting a cost of debt close enough to the truth. So now, let's finish up the process. For Bookscape, there is no actual rating. I had to use the synthetic rating, private bookstore, 1.3% default spread, add that to the T-bond rate, I've got my cost of debt for Bookscape. And again, the pushback can be, it's a private business. They're not gonna issue bonds. And imagine being a small private business, walking into a bank, say, I did my synthetic rating this morning, I got a AAA rating, lend me money at a 0.3% default spread, good luck with that. Because when you borrow from a bank, the bank is gonna look at you, they're gonna look at your financials. And with a private company, maybe I should be pushing up that cost of debt to reflect the fact that you really have no choices. You got to borrow from the local Chase Bank. And whatever the loan officer sets as your rate is the rate you've got to take. But at least I have a starting point for my cost of debt for Bookscape. For the three publicly traded firms, I took the risk-free rate, added the default spread, came up with the cost of debt, and here's the final tweak. Remember we said debt brings a tax advantage. When you borrow money and you have interest expenses, and those interest expenses are tax deductible, effectively you're paying less on your debt. The way we, could, we bring this into the cost of capital is you multiply your pre-tax cost of debt by one minus the tax rate. So if you have a 5% cost of debt and a 40% tax rate, in effect, you're paying only 3%. That tax rate, though, should be a marginal tax rate. And let me back up and flesh out what that means. When you look at a company's financials, you'll see a tax rate. It's called an effective tax rate. It's like an average tax rate across all your income. The marginal tax rate is the tax rate on your last dollar of income, which is going to come from the corporate tax code. You're not going to find that usually in your financials. So in the US, that number is going to be 21% is the corporate tax rate right now at the federal level, state and local taxes be anywhere from 24, 25, 27 percent. That number used to be 40 percent until 2017 because the federal corporate tax rate used to be 35 percent. 
The effective tax rate is the tax rate across all of your income. The marginal tax rate is the tax rate in your last dollar of income. Now let me back in why we use the marginal tax rate when we, use the, when we do the after-tax cost of debt. Interest saves you taxes at the margin. Let me give you a very simple example to illustrate that. Let's say you have a company with $100 million in income. It has $10 million in interest expenses. To compute the taxable income, what are you allowed to do? You take the $100 million in, in pre-tax income, you subtract the $10 million, you report $90 million in taxable income. You pay taxes on the $90 million. Step back and think about where you saved your taxes. You didn't save it on the first $10 million, the middle $10 million, it's always on the last 10 million. The tax benefit of debt is always at the margin. And companies know this and exploit it. Let me give you a very simple example. You take a company like Apple. Effective tax rate is about 16%. Why? Because they've income from all over the globe, from other parts of the world, where the tax rate is much lower. They have about $100 billion in debt on the balance sheet. Sounds like a lot of money for a $3 trillion company. $100 billion is not a lot of debt, but it's still, in absolute terms, a lot of debt. Guess where Apple parks all of its debt? Even though it's a global company with revenues from all over, it doesn't keep its debt in Ireland. It doesn't keep it in Hong Kong. It keeps it in the US. Why? Because it gets a tax benefit of about 27% on its interest expense in the US. It'd be getting a tax benefit of 12.5% in Ireland and 15% in Hong Kong. Companies find a way to maximize their tax benefits from debt because they can choose where to keep the debt and they will keep the debt where the tax benefits are greatest. So a marginal tax rate here is basically the tax rate that you're paying on your last dollar of income. Now, I'll, I'll make this at, at the individual level. And now, how many of you do your own taxes? Anybody do your own taxes here? Now, I, do to I use TurboTax, right? You might use your own version. If you use TurboTax, you know, you go through the process and you finish your tax return. It delivers this final message. I think it does it just to piss you off. Congratulations, you're done. This year, you paid 29.13% of your adjusted gross income in taxes. That's like an effective tax rate. They take the adjusted gross income, they take the taxes for that year, that's an effective tax rate. That's not your marginal tax rate. I don't know how many of you plan to live and work in New York after you graduate. How many, anybody here? Okay. I'm gonna depress you right now. When you start earning income, let's think about what your marginal tax rate is going to look like in New York City. I'll put you up in tax brackets. First, you're very quickly going to hit the 37% tax bracket if you go to work for an investment bank, consulting firm, even a corporate. So your federal tax rate on your last dollar of income is going to be 37%. Of course, you've got all those brackets, you, but there's no way you're going to qualify for the 15%, hopefully, because if your income is that low, you really shouldn't have spent the money you did on your MBA, but that's too late <laughs> to fix. So you're going to start at 37%. You think, what do you mean start? Hey, there's a whole line of guys outside waiting to collect more taxes from you in New York. First, you've got New York State. You know what the marginal tax rate is going to look like for New York State? I think it's like 10 point something percent. They were briefly talking about making that 12.5%, so thank God that hasn't happened. It's like 10.8%. So New York State takes 10.8%. So let's see where we are. You had 37% federal plus 10.8 state taxes. It used to be that you could get a federal tax savings on the 10.8, but those days are gone because of the 2017. So you're already up at like 47%. I'm not done yet. You've got city taxes of about 3.5%. It's pushes you 51, 52 percent. It's only a matter of time before Chelsea decides it's going to put a 2 percent tax on you, and then your neighborhood street says, I'll collect my 1 percent. We're very quickly heading up to 53, 54, 55 percent taxes. That's the bad news. The good news is if you decide to borrow money to buy your condo, 
the tax benefits from borrowing money will mean that if you borrow money at 4%, in effect, you're borrowing money at 1.9 or 1.8%. It's the after-tax cost of debt that matters, and it's a very simple explanation for why as tax brackets climb, you're going to see more debt being taken on because you get a bigger tax benefit. So the after-tax cost of debt for my three rated companies is right there. For Tata Motors, I did find a rating, but it wasn't an S&P or a Moody's rating. It was a rating from an Indian rating agency called Chrysler. It's been around, it's well respected, but that rating is relative to other Indian companies. A AAA rating from Chrysler is not the same as a AAA rating from S&P, because Chrysler looks just at Indian companies. If you take the AA minus and put a default spread on it, you're getting a default spread for an Indian company given other Indian companies. So here's how I'm going to build up to a cost of debt for Tata Motors. I'm going to start with my Indian rupee risk free rate, and I'm going to add two default spreads to it. One is the default spread for Tata Motors as a company. The other is the default spread for India. That default spread I took out is now coming back into my cost of debt. So my cost of debt in repeat terms is 9.62%. Net of the marginal taxes, that cost of debt is 6.5%. So let's review. If you have an S&P or Moody's rating for your company, just look up the default spread for the rating, add it to the risk-free rate, you're done. If you're doing a synthetic rating, if it's a US company, you can take the synthetic rating, get a default spread, add to the risk-free rate, you're done. But if it's an emerging market company and you've done a synthetic rating, you take the risk-free rate in that currency, whatever currency you're working with, and you have to add two default spreads, one based on your rating and one, based, one for the country, because you've got to bring that country risk into play. Any questions on the cost of debt? Now, of course, the key ingredient here to get your cost of debt is a default spread. So once you've got the rating for your company, you've got to convert that rating into a default spread. And default spreads change over time. They change over time for exactly the same reasons that risk premiums change over time. They change over time because people get either more optimistic or more pessimistic, more worried or less worried. Fear and greed fight out there, and a default spread reflects that change. To show you how much they can change, I've taken the default spreads from 2015 through 2022 for different ratings classes. And basically, you can see they kind of move around. Some years, they move more than others. And in years like 2020, you can see huge moves in the default spread over the course of the year. In fact, in 2020, we started the year. This is pre-COVID. The blue is the start of the year. So if you, let's take a rating like triple B. Started the year at 1.33%. Three months later, that default spread was 3.73%. You think, what happened? COVID hit, the economy shut down, people got scared, default spreads widened. By the end of the year, the fear had dissipated, default spreads had come down again. It's not as bad this year, but it's happening this year too. If you take a look at default spreads now, across the board, they're significantly higher than they were at the start of the year. Especially in the last three weeks, you've seen default spreads widen. They widen for countries, they widen for companies. What I'm trying to say in a long-winded way is when you compute the cost of debt for your company, you might want to get the most updated default spread you can get for that rating. So your rating might not change, but your default spread is going to change if people are getting more scared. That's part of the reason I put together that Bloomberg YouTube video, because I want you to be able to look up the default spread for a triple B rated bond, if that's what your rating is right now as opposed to what, because I have it on my website for January 1st, 2022, but that's already old data. The numbers have shifted. So I'm assuming you've picked a company. I might be completely delusional at this point. I'm assuming that you've kind of done the corporate governance, so let's act like you have. You got a bottom-up beta, you're right there. You've got a cost of equity even. So now you want to compute a cost of debt. Go through the process. Start with an interest coverage ratio and do a synthetic. Even if your company has a rating, just try this out. See what you get as a rating. You might revert back to the actual rating. 
Computer cost of debt, both before taxes and after taxes. I gave you a sense of what the marginal tax rate is in the US. If you go to my website, you can get marginal tax rates by country for I think 180 countries. So go to my updated data. I would love to tell you that I did the hard work of collecting this data, but I'd be lying. I just stole it from KPMG. KPMG does this every year. I steal it from them. They, they, I tell them I'm stealing it from you and putting it on my website. They don't seem to mind. So thank KPMG when you look at that table because you can look up what the tax rate is in pretty much any country in the world. And you will need that if you have a company from that country to get a cost of debt in that country. So let's complete the process. You've got a cost of equity based on your beta, risk premiums, risk free rates, cost of debt based on the risk free rate, the default spread, and the marginal tax rate. Most of the time, you're done because those are the only two ways of raising money. But once in a while, and some of you will have these companies, companies create what are called hybrid securities. You know what a hybrid is? Basically, you take some aspects of debt and some aspects of equity and create a security that has both aspects. I'll give you the two most common examples of hybrid securities you're going to run into. One is truly a pain in the neck. It's called preferred stock. In Latin America, preferred stock is this common stock without voting rights. You can treat it like equity. But in the US, preferred stock is more like bonds than stock. The reason it's more like bonds is when companies issue preferred stock, they actually set a dividend on that preferred stock up front. So they say a dividend on this preferred stock will be 6%. And they have to pay the dividend. If they don't pay the dividend, they've got to give up voting rights, so it's very much like a bond. So your first instinct is, I'm going to treat, treat preferred stock as debt, right? But here's the catch. Remember we talked about interest being tax deductible? Preferred dividends are not tax deductible. So if you throw them in with debt, you risk understating their cost because it's very expensive debt. You're saying, why would companies even issue preferred stock then? There are two groups of companies that are big issuers of preferred stock. One is very young companies that issue convertible preferred stock, which is complete fiction, and here's why. Most of the value of that preferred stock comes from the conversion option. And when they do pay a preferred dividend, the reason they don't care about the tax benefit, they're money losing in the first place. What difference does it make whether they borrow money or issue preferred stock? That's one group, but that's a small group. The biggest issuers of preferred stock in the US are banks. You know why banks like preferred stock? Because when they issue preferred stock, it's counted as equity and counts towards their regulatory capital. So what they're saying is, look, I know it's really expensive. It's an expensive way of borrowing, but while we borrow, the regulatory authorities pat us on the back and tell us how good we're doing because our regulatory capital. It's a stupid reason to do this. But you can see why regulatory definitions can drive what company. Most of you should not be doing banks, or none of you should be doing banks. But if you do have preferred stock on your balance sheet, here's what I want you to do. Take a look at the number. And if it's less than 5% of the overall value of the company, act like it's not there. Take a, line, you know, take a mark and cross it through. I don't see it. It's a pain in the neck, as I said. Why bring in this small slice and then spend hours trying to attach a cost to it? It's already the preferred dividend here. So it's less than 5%, ignore it. If it's more than 5%, you have no choice but to open a third component for capital. You got equity, cost of equity, debt, cost of debt after taxes, and preferred stock, and the cost of preferred stock. So that's one type of hybrid. And as I said, banks are the biggest issuers. The other is convertible debt. And that's a much simpler, much more understandable hybrid. Convertible debt, you've got a bond that can be converted into stock. So it's like an option on top of a bond. The conversion option is equity. The bond is, of course, debt. A convertible debt is a walking hybrid. You can actually break it out. It's much simpler to deal with than a preferred for that reason. You can say, this portion is debt. And this portion is equity. The conversion option is equity. So if you have convertible debt, break it out into its two components. It's not difficult to do. Throw the debt part into debt, the conversion option to equity, move on. You're done. So when you have hybrids, don't let them get in the way 
of computing your cost of capital. Most of the time, you're going to end up with debt and equity and a cost of capital that reflects it. Yes? On the PE side, when you calculate the cost of debt, where should we assume if it's a multinational company? Should we assume it's in the US? Or I would just say take, take the country of incorporation because the logic is you probably want to put your debt where the marginal tax rate is highest. If you're a US company, you're already towards that. You know. But what if you're an Irish company? What if you're Ryanair? Now, obviously, you don't want to borrow money just in Ireland because your marginal tax benefits are lowest. You'd like to borrow money in Germany. But remember, you're allowed to claim the interest expense only against the income from that country. So you, you can't just go to the highest marginal tax rate and borrow money if you don't have enough income. So I would just say the safest thing to do is just take the country of incorporation, take the marginal tax rate of that country, and use it to compute the cost of debt for the country. 95% of the time, that's going to work. The exceptional cases, you can think about what do I do? You can actually look at where the debt is actually issued. Any other questions? So we now have a cost of equity, a cost of debt. We've dealt with the hybrids. Let's complete the process of computing the cost of capital. I'm going to state a, a basic rule in all of finance that still puzzles accountants. The weights you should be using on debt and equity so let's go back to the base case. You have debt and equity. The weights you should be using on debt and equity should be market value weights. As opposed to what? Accountants work really hard at the, those book value numbers, right? If you look at a, at a balance sheet, there's debt on the balance sheet. That's a book value of debt. And there's also a shareholder's equity number. Think of how much work went into that number. I don't blame accountants for saying, why are you ignoring us? We spent all these weeks and months coming up with the shareholder's equity. Why don't you use book value weights? So when I present this to a room where there are a majority of accountants, the pushback is, we use book value weights. In fact, about a third of all companies when they compute their hurdle rates, use book value weights. And I'll give you the three reasons they give, all of which don't stand up to scrutiny. So here are the three reasons accountants give for using book value weights. The first is they say book value is more reliable than market value. You know why? Because it doesn't move as much. Let's take the part of that statement that's true. What part of that statement is true? doesn't move as much, right? In fact, we know exactly how often it moves. It moves only four times a year for a US company when you redo your balance sheets every quarter. And if you do your balance sheets once a year, it gets even more reliable, right? If I follow this line of reasoning, if you never revisit your balance sheet, you create the most reliable measure of equity ever because the book value never changes. It's an absurd argument. That's like arguing that a thermometer that's stuck at 98.6 degrees all the time is more reliable than one that shoots around just because you have a fever. You could be dying with a 105 degree temperature. And the thermometer says, you're OK. I think the fact that book value of equity does not move makes it less reliable. Because at least the market is trying, right? If you're looking at a Severstall or a Spur Bank right now, you know what's happened to the book value of equity in the last three weeks? Nothing. But the market value of equity reflects that the bad things going on that affect the value of this company. So let's take that off the table. Just because book value doesn't change doesn't make it more reliable. So that argument doesn't make sense. The second argument you hear from accountants is they say, look, we, we just, we're just trying to be conservative. And the reason they say that is the book value of equity for 90% of companies globally is less than the market value of equity. And sometimes by immense amounts. The market value of equity at Apple is 50 times the book value of equity. So they said, we're just being conservative by using the book value of equity. But are you? Think of what happens when you use book value of equity and book value of debt in, in, in terms of weights in your cost of capital. With book value of equity and book value of debt, with Apple, I'm going to say there's 70% equity, 30% debt, because the book equity is such a small number. When you use more debt in your cost of capital, guess what you do to your cost of capital? You bring it down because your after-tax cost of debt is lower than your cost of equity. So you're telling me that using a lower hurdle rate in deciding whether to take projects is more conservative? That doesn't strike me as conservative. You're taking projects you shouldn't even be touching. 
because you've used book value weights. So that doesn't work either. And then they fall back on a loser argument. The loser argument is accounting returns, returns on equity, returns in invested capital, which accountants use all the time to measure the quality of projects, are based on book value. And that's true. We use book values, and that's the only place in finance we use book values. And they say, look, to be consistent, I should be using book value weights in the cost of capital. That's a very strange definition of consistency, because if I went out and raised equity and raised debt today, I would raise them at market value, no matter what you tell me your book value is. Can you imagine Tesla issuing <coughs> shares at book value? I'd be buying those shares like crazy, and you would too. Because it'd be like $3 per share. You'd get an incredible bargain. So let's cut to the chase. There is no good or even decent argument for using book value weights. Even for private companies, I'm going to argue that rather than use book value weights, I'll use estimated market value weights. Book value weights should never be an option. But even there, there's a market value of equity, right? Spur Bank has a book value of equity. Why would I want to use it? It's, it's a regulatory, the regulators care about it because they feel that that is a proxy for what they can fall back safely. But I'm not even sure that's a good, I mean, right now, if you're a regulator looking at Spur Bank, the book value of equity looks pretty safe, right? They have tier one capital. But I'd be terrified about whether the bank can make it through. So even at the regulatory level, I think we're making a mistake by putting so much attention on book equity. I'll tell you one other reason. Book equity is going to get you into trouble when you do cost of capital weights. Can, can market value of equity ever be negative? Have you ever seen a stock trade at a negative price? We, we see all kinds of things. Maybe one of these days we will all trade it at a negative price. But a stock, because once you hit zero, you're done, right? The, comp the, the stock gets taken off the listing. A market value of equity can never be below zero, which is good, right? Because your weights have to be positive. Can the book value of equity be negative? 10% of global companies at the start of 2022, that's 4,000 or 4,500 companies had negative book values of equity. And many of them are actually very well, in companies that do very well. Apple briefly had a negative book value of equity three years ago. A lot of young companies going public, like Airbnb and Uber, at the time they go public, have negative book values of equity. How does a company end up with negative book value of equity? What's happened to this company? Well, if it's an Airbnb or an Uber, there's been no buy For the Apple, that was the reason. Buybacks made a big effect on the book equity. So that's one reason for mature companies. Yep. Uh, I think you might be looking at the symptom, because that's how you end up with a book equity. My question is, how did that happen, right? Yes. They raise capital, so the minute you raise capital, think of how book shareholders' equity is computed, right? When you raise capital, your equity goes up. Every time you lose money, I've got to take it out of the book equity, right? Think of book equity. If you're writing a mathematical equation, it's a summation of all of your retained earnings over time. So if you have a huge buyback, the retained earnings can be a negative. If you lose money, it can be negative. And I keep losing money, sooner or later, I'm going to hit zero, and I'm going to keep going. So please, please, in week 15, don't email me saying, I'm having trouble computing the cost of capital. My equity weight is negative. Because then I already know you've taken the wrong path. Because the only way your equity weight can be negative is because you're using book equity. And book equity should not even be an option to look at when you compute cost of capital. So let's talk about market values. That should be easy to get, right? And if you're looking at equity for a publicly traded company, it is relatively easy. You think, why is this relatively easy? For most companies, share price times number of shares. You think, how much easier can that get? 
Well, there are little tweaks to number of shares you've got to worry about. With restricted stock units, what's the share count? It's actually much more difficult. It's like nailing jello to a wall nowadays, thinking about how many shares does this company have outstanding. Because you might have seven class of restricted stock, there might be, but you know, you can come to a market value equity and you can look up the market cap for your company in Yahoo Finance and they do a pretty good job of looking at the consolidated value. So market equity is relatively easy. Market debt is a little more problematic and here's why. There are company, many companies in the US issue bonds, but those same companies often have bank debt they've taken on. And in fact, there are some companies where all of the debt is bank debt. You're saying, so what? When I take bank debt, I show that as my face value of debt. But remember, this debt is not traded. So a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, I show the same value for the debt. This is the reason why many people use a shortcut when it comes to market value of debt. They say, look, I cannot estimate the market value of debt, therefore, if any of you worked in an investment bank, fill in the rest. What do you end up using as your proxy for market value of debt? You just use the book value of debt. You wave your hands and say it's pretty close, it's not going to be. And for most companies, you're going to get away with it, right? It's not like market value of equity where you're going to trade it 10 times book value. So it's going to be pretty close. And most of the time, you can get away with it. But I'll tell you when it's going to get you into trouble. In fact, you can probably prepare the groundwork for when the market value of debt can diverge significantly from the book value of debt. What kinds of companies are you going to see that divergence? Well, even emerging market companies. You issued the debt at a fair rate and nothing's happened to the rate. Companies that are in distress. Do you see why when companies get distressed, what do you see as market value of debt is going to be very different from the book value of debt? In fact, which direction is it going to go? Is market value going to be less or more? It's going to be discounted because people say, look, I'm not, there's, you might tell me you owe a billion, but I don't think I'm going to collect the billion, so the market value of this debt is going to be only 200 million. So I think it's dangerous just using book value without thinking through it, because what if the company you're looking at has a single B rating and it used to be a double A rated company? So I'm going to give you a quick and dirty way of converting book value of debt to market value of debt for companies which have no traded debt. I'm going to use Disney as my example, even though there I could have got a significant portion of the debt from the corporate bond market, they still had about half their debt from bank debt. Their book value of debt was 14,288 million. That came right off the balance sheet. That's all of their interest bearing debt. The interest expense on the debt in the most recent year was 349 million. So the book value of debt is 14,288. The interest expense is 349 million. And in the footnotes, Disney actually told me when the debt comes due. Most companies do this. So in the footnotes, it's a debt coming due in year one, year two, year three, and the weighted average maturity of the debt that they report in the footnotes was 7.92 years. Notice that the debt they report in the footnotes doesn't match up to the total debt. That's because not all of the debt was broken down in the footnotes. But I'm going to bring that data together. You got a book value of debt at 14,288. You got an interest expense of 349 million and you got a maturity on this debt on average of about 7.92 years. I'm going to treat this like a gigantic bond. The face value of the bond is going to be the 14,288 million. That's due in 7.92 years. The interest expense is like a coupon. Let's make it annual. I don't know why play games and make it semi-annual. Let's make it annual. So I'm going to get a coupon of 349 million for the next 7.92 years. And at the end of the 7.92 years, I'm going to get the book value back. I've already computed a cost of debt for Disney. Remember, based on its rating, it's 3.75%. So I'm basically treating it like a bond and pricing it like a bond. Because the price of a bond is the present value of the coupons. That's what this first part of the equation is. If it, sounds, if it looks unfamiliar, it's because you've been using the payment button on your financial calculator too long, right? Because that's exactly what goes in. It's the present value of an annuity. That's the, equa the actual equation that gives you the present value. So if you don't, if you don't want to use the equation, just hit payment 7.92 years and 3.75%. That's going to give you the present value of the coupon plus the present value of the face value at the end. And what I get as my market value for debt, at least the interest bearing debt, is about 13 billion. 
Why is it lower than my book value? Remember, this is like a bond, right? When does a bond trade at below par? What's got to be true about the interest rate on the bond relative to the coupon rate? Interest rates are higher. Interest rates are higher than the coupon rate you trade below. That's basically what's happening here. The book interest rate is what I get with the coupon. If I take the interest expense and divide by book value of debt, I get like 3.4%. My market interest rate is 3.75%. So when I take the present value, it reflects it. And now you can see if you have a distressed company, what's going to happen, right? What's going to happen to the market interest rate? It's going to go to 6 or 7 or 8%. The coupons stay the same. The face value stays the same. But the market value of the debt is going to go from 13 to 11 to 9 to 8 it's not rocket science. I mean, we're just taking all of the debt. Yeah. The one number you might have trouble finding for your company right off the bat. The, the book value of debt and interest expense should be easy. It's that weighted maturity of debt. Some companies are good about doing it. If you cannot find the maturity of the debt, obviously just use the book value. Because remember, as that maturity approaches very short time periods, the book value and the market value will converge. That's why I put together, again, that Bloomberg lookup, because they have a function called DDIS for a company, where if you type that in, you get the weighted maturity of the debt right there. So you can see what the weighted maturity of your debt is for your company. So that is the market value of interest-bearing debt. But if you remember, I said that's only a piece of the debt puzzle. That's the obvious one, the interest-bearing debt, and I now have a market value. Until 2019, Accountants miss the other type of debt, which is lease commitments. And we fixed it, so I'll talk about what they've done to fix it. But until 2019, that debt was not showing up in the balance sheet. I had to bring it in explicitly. So I'll take you through the process of what you do when you have lease commitments to bring them into the debt number. Yeah. If you have lease commitments, even before 2019, U.S. companies had to report those commitments in a footnote. So you were expensing the current year's lease expense, but in the footnotes you told me what your lease commitments for in year, you know, next year, two years out. So they would give it for the next five years, and beyond the fifth year, they'd give me a lump sum. In the case of, uh, in the case of Disney, that lump sum was $1,784 million. So that's beyond year five. I know they're not going to pay $1,784 million in year six. It spread out over time. So what I did was I took the 1,784 and made it into a five-year annuity. Why five? Because I looked at the level of lease payments and I wanted to pick a time period that made the lease commitment beyond year five look like the lease commitments for the first five years. I have my lease commitments now for the next 10 years and here's all I need to do to convert it to debt. You take those lease commitments, you discount them back at 3.75%. You say, where did that come from? That's the pre-tax cost of debt I computed for Disney based on its rating. Discounting the lease commitments at the pre-tax cost of debt. And we use the pre-tax because these lease commitments are pre-tax commitments. I'll still get a tax advantage on them later. What I get as a present value is $2.932 billion. That should have been treated as debt in 2013 at Disney. Accountants chose not to. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to override the accounting, and I'm going to say, look, if you ask me how much debt does Disney have, I'm going to say it's 13,028. That's a market value of interest-bearing debt, plus the 2.933 billion, which is the present value of lease commitments, which gives me a total debt for Disney of 15,961 million. And from this page on, whenever I talk about total debt at Disney, I'm going to talk about 15,961 million. Because lease, lease commitments are, in fact, debt and should have always been treated as debt. It took a long fight. But in 2019, both IFRS and GAAP finally conceded that they'd been screwing up. Remember, 85% of all off-balance sheet debt pre-2019 took the form of lease commitments. We talk, talked about all these you know, you know, strange ways in which companies can take. This was the, 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 the big problem that needed to be fixed. So starting in 2019, and this is your lucky day, accountants have taken over. 
So now when you look at the balance sheet for your company, if it's a US company or a European company, there are emerging markets where these rules still don't apply. If you have a US or European company, in your balance sheet, you're going to see traditional debt. You're also going to see lease debt. And what accountants are doing, exactly what I did on the previous page. But there is a small problem with outsourcing this to accountants, which is they're going to use the pre-tax cost of debt at a point in time which would be December 31st of 2021. And remember what we said about default spreads widening? That number will not get updated because accountants don't feel the need to update those numbers. Thank God you're still getting the lease commitments as a footnote. So what I do with companies, and this is because I don't trust the debt number that comes from the balance sheet, is I do it myself and compare the two numbers. And for US companies, I'm usually within 10 or 15%. For European companies, I'm off by about 40%. For Asian companies, I'm off by 75% in some cases, telling me that there are loopholes in the accounting rules that allow some of these companies to continue to do what they've done pre-2019. But here's the advantage of knowing how to convert lease commitments to debt, even if you trust the accountants on the number. It's not just lease commitments that you worry about, right? It's any kind of contractual commitment. You've got to make a payment in good times and bad times. I'll give you a few examples of contractual commitments out there that are still not treated as debt, but if you use the argument we've used with leases, should start to come into debt. If you take a company like Netflix, you know what I'm missing when I focus just on lease commitments? Well, it's not even that, you, you've seen that Seinfeld is on Netflix now? Before that, the most watched show on Netflix, I think in 2018, was Friends. What I'm trying to say is, Netflix makes a lot of original content, but it's amazing, amazing how much of the content that's watched still comes from other content producers. For a long time, Disney spin-offs used to end up on Netflix, right? Luke Cage, you had uh, Daredevil, He's saying, how does Netflix get this content? It leases them out. That basically, that's what it's doing. It signs a five-year agreement with Disney saying, we'll carry the Avengers movies and you'll make $200 million every year from us. It's a contractual commitment. And in Disney's, I'm sorry, Netflix's balance sheet, if you look at the footnotes, in addition to lease commitments, they also specify content commitments. You take the present value of those content commitments, you get 15 to 20 billion dollars. Doesn't make Netflix a bad company, it just means that Netflix already has debt. The debt takes a form of content commitments. How much did Manchester United agree to pay Ronaldo when he signed? I don't follow Premier League soccer. No. Let's say they paid him 35 million for the next three years. You take any sports team. I mean, my favorite team is a master of doing this. You lock yourself up for the next 10 years and pay $27.5 million to an over-the-hill third baseman. That's a contractual commitment. The Yankees, when they signed that contract with A-Rod, were borrowing $230 million, whether they showed it on the balance sheet or not. So this is a process you can use to convert any kind of contractual commitment into debt. And I would suggest you do it because it's going to give you a much truer sense of what the company's actually borrowing. So it took us a long time to get there, but you have a market value of equity for your company. So we have multiple class of shares, count them all. You can get an estimated market value of debt for your company. I would suggest getting the book values as well, so you can see how different the numbers look for your company. Then compute your cost of capital using market value weights, which is the right thing to do. And then recompute your cost of capital using book value weights. So you can counter those accountants who are saying, I'm just being conservative, and show them the two costs of capital. Yes? If your company has a large pension liability, can we also include that in? That's actually an interesting question. In Germany and in, I think, other parts of Europe, you show pension assets and pension liabilities. So pension assets show up on the asset side, pension liabilities show up on the liability side. And you can count the pension liabilities. In the US, you don't show the amounts. You actually net them out, which means all you have to show on your balance sheet is whether, you're whether you've underfunded or overfunded your pension plan. 
So if you're going to count the pension liabilities as debt, then you have to count the income from the pension assets as earnings. So it gets really messy. So our, my suggestion is net them out. If they net out close to zero, just take it out. It's, a, it's kind of a non-player. If they net out and it's significantly negative, your liabilities exceed your assets, then I think you should be counting them as debt, especially in Europe where they have contractual follow-ups, right? If you've got an underfunded pension plan in the US, you should show the liability, but there's no teeth to it. It's not that you're required to bring in a billion dollars every year for the next three years to make it up. So in the US, I'm less inclined to treat it as debt because that contractual part is missing. In Europe, I'm far more likely to include in debt because there, if you fall below your pension assets, then you've got to come up with the difference. So let's do the cost of capital for Disney. It took us a long time to get it. So this is the culmination of the last 100 pages, maybe 150 pages. I want a cost of equity and a cost of debt. I start with the risk free rate. I use the T-bond rate. Remind me again why? Because I chose to compute the cost of capital for Disney in US dollars. Could I have done the whole thing in euros? Absolutely. Currency is a choice. I picked the dollar choice because it, you know, every, all my numbers are in dollars. So the risk-free rate is a T-bond rate. For some of you, this will take more work, right? If you have an emerging market currency, you've got to clean it up, but that's the base. The beta is the bottom of beta. I know it was a, quite a while ago, but remember I broke Disney down to five businesses, took a weighted average, took the levered beta, 1.00. I'm not using the regression beta 1.25 because I don't trust it. The equity risk premium is the equity risk premium that reflects where Disney gets its revenues. I think it was 81% US, 19% overseas, or whatever that breakdown was. That reflects a breakdown. Cost of equity of 8.52%. Let's take the cost of debt. Start with the same risk-free rate. Make that a rule. Whatever risk-free rate you start your cost of equity with, you start your cost of debt with. Don't fall into that because companies say, but I have only five-year debt. Could you use a five-year? No, this has nothing to do with what the maturity of your debt is. I'm going to treat all your debt as if it's long-term debt. So I'm going to start with the same risk free rate. The 1% default spread came from the actual rating. For Disney, if you don't have an actual rating, you'd use a synthetic rating. If it's an emerging market company, you might have to add the country default spread. But basically, that's my pre-tax cost of debt. The marginal tax rate for Disney was 36.1%. Cost of debt after tax is 2.4%. Now, if I just stop there and you look at those two numbers, equity costs you 8.5%, debt costs you 2.4%. Where's your brain going as the next step? Equity is more expensive than debt. So if I use more debt, my costly capital should come down, right? That basically seems to be the logical follow through is why doesn't Disney use more debt? Don't go there yet because it's not that simple. Because with that simple, you know what Disney should do, right? Go to 100% debt, its cost of capital go to 2.4%. This is a dynamic process. There's an entire set of questions we need to ask before we make that judgment. But right now, Disney, based on its equity, is about 88.4% equity, 11.6% debt, and in that debt, I'm including the least debt as well, which might be less work for you because accountants have done it for you, but if you don't trust accountants, your company's not doing it, Make sure you bring those commitments in. My cost of capital is 7.81%. 8.52% is my cost of equity. 7.81% is my cost of capital. Now for Disney, I can do the cost of capital by division, because remember I'd broken it down by business. So in addition to giving you a cost of equity for broadcasting, I can give you a cost of capital. And because the debt ratios at Disney are different for different divisions, my cost of capital reflects those different ways. In the case of Vale, I did my cost of capital both in US dollars and in RIAs. And the RIA calculation is very simply just the additional inflation on top of my dollar numbers. And finally, for Tata Motors and Baidu and Bookscape, it was a fairly simple process because I was doing everything in rupees. I have a cost of equity and a cost of debt. I take the weights based on market values. And remember I said Baidu looks impressive on a ratings basis, but the reason it's impressive is it uses very little debt. You can see that in the weights. Baidu is only about 5% equity, 95% debt. Even across the five companies we have, 
you can see how debt ratios vary across companies. Yes? So for, for Bali, that's uh, the tax that you use for the Brazilian tax? 34%, yeah. So for each company, I'm using, and for but in Bali, it actually makes sense to stay in Brazil with their debt. Because the Canadian tax rate is lower than 34%. They have very little revenues in the US. So if you think about the parts of the world they were operating in, 34% was the biggest tax benefit they could get. They stayed in Brazil. So that's where I'd like you to get to when you get a chance. Is can you get a bottom up beta, get a cost of equity, get a rating, get a cost of debt, get those market value weights. You know, it's not difficult, it's just sequential. You, got, you can't jump steps. Okay. So along the way you will have to make these estimates. But at the end of the process, you should have a cost of equity and a cost of capital for your company. Now, what, is, what, is, what, what part of corporate finance are we nailing down with this? We're getting a hurdle rate for the company, right? So what's a hurdle rate for Disney? Well, it's 8.42%. Oh, by the way, it's also 7.81%. You're saying, how can you have two numbers operating as hurdle rates? So I'm going to lay the foundations for why we do both the cost of equity and a cost of capital. And for the moment, it's going to sound abstract, but when we start looking at numbers for projects, you're going to see the difference. If your focus is on equity, if you're trying to measure returns on equity, if you're looking at cash flows to equity, your hurdle rate becomes the cost of equity. If you're measuring returns to the entire firm, return on invested capital, cash flows to the business, your hurdle rate becomes the cost of capital. They're both hurdle rates, but which one you use will depend on what perspective you bring to an analysis. As I said, right now that sounds abstract, but when we look at actual projects, you can see how these two perspectives can lead you to very different numbers for the same project. So that took us a while, almost halfway through the class. But I think now when I state that original sub-principle, there should be some flesh to it. Remember you said the hurdle rate should reflect the riskiness of the project? So now I've asked you, how do we measure risk? With equity, we measure it as a risk you cannot diversify away at publicly traded companies captured by a beta. With debt, we measure it with the default spread that comes from you know, ratings if you have them, but even if you don't have ratings, how much credit risk there is in you. Should reflect the mix of debt and equity that showed up in the weights you saw in the cost of capital. So basically, the cost of capital kind of takes that sub-principle and puts it all into numbers. The risk is in the cost of equity and the debt, and the mix is in the weights. So let's please start on the other half of the investment principle. What do the investment principles say? Go out and find investments that make a return that exceeds the hurdle rate. So today, at least, I want to lay the foundations for how we think about returns in finance. So I lay out the sub-principle. The return should reflect, should be based on cash flows cash in, cash out, should reflect when you get the cash flows. You'd rather get them earlier rather than later. And if you start throwing buzzwords at me, my job is to bring them into the cash flows. Things like strategic and synergy and whatever else you want to throw into the mix. So let's start with that question of why do we look at cash flows? After all, as I said, accountants go to all this trouble of delivering a bottom line, which is accounting earnings. Why do we look at cash flows? To understand why we focus on cash flows. For a very brief period, I want to think like an accountant. Then, then get out of that mind frame very quickly. Let's think about how accounting comes to its bottom line. I'm not an accountant, but as I look at accounting, there seem to be two broad principles that govern how accountants estimate that bottom line. The first is this notion of accrual earnings. Remember what accrual earnings requires you to do? It requires you to record transactions as they happen rather than when you pay or get paid. So if you sell something on December 30th, even though you haven't been paid for it yet, you showed us revenues this year. And then you have to work on what the expenses were for those revenues even if you haven't paid for them or you paid for them last year. You know what a much more honest way to do accounting is, right? It's cash accounting. But well, basically, it's checkbook accounting. You reflect revenues as you get paid, and you reflect expense. And if you run a very small business, you can get away doing cash accounting. You just have to stay consistent. But if you're a company or any kind of business, you have to use accrual accounting. 
So file that away. The second is accounting makes a big deal about classifying expenses into three groups. When you look at accounting expenses, and I remember my first accounting class, the accounting professor came with three cardboard boxes that he'd labeled. The first he labeled operating expense, it's low cost props. Second was financial expense, and the third he labeled as capital expense. And I remember what he said. He said in accounting we're religious about how we put in expenses. I didn't know he was lying then, but I know he's lying now. And here's the definition used for each box. He said, operating expenses are any expenses associated with delivering revenues this year. So if you buy raw materials, obvious operating expense. You pay wages for workers on the assembly line, obvious operating expense. He said, financial expenses are expenses associated with the use of debt. So he threw an interest expense in there. And then he said, capital expenses are any expenses designed to create benefits over many years. And he gave the classic accounting examples. Land, building, equipment, machinery. You're saying, so what? Everything has its place, right? Operating expenses show up in your income statement right below revenues. Financial expenses show up in your income statement below the operating income line. And what happens to capital expenses? What do accountants do? They spread it out over time. That's what capitalizing is, right? And they're being, you can see the logic of what they're trying to do, right? If you spend on something where you're going to get benefits over 10 years, they're saying, look, we'll spread it out over the next 10 years. They call it depreciation or amortization. There's a neatness to this process. Now you can see why some people like accounting. Everything is neatly tied up. The reason I said we know they were lying when they talked about being religious is we've talked about one expense that we're routinely miscategorizing, which we just fixed, right? What was it? Leases. Leases. Until 2019, lease expense was showing up in the operating expense box when it should have shown up in the financial expense box. And there's another expense that's being routinely miscategorized. What did I say capital expenditures were? Expenses designed to create benefits over many years, right? So if you're a manufacturing firm, that's going to be land building equipment. But if you're a technology firm or a pharmaceutical firm, what should be going into that bucket? It should be R&D. There's a whole lot of things wrong with accounting, but part of the problem here is accounting was designed for the old time manufacturing company. It's being bent and tweaked and you know, massaged to make it work for it, but it's not going to. You almost have to start from scratch and build up. So I feel sympathy for accounting because you have a legacy problem, which is you have all these CPAs who've learned the accounting rules as they were, and if you start from scratch, what you're saying is nothing you've learned makes sense anymore. We're going to start. It's not going to happen. So accounting is always going to lag common sense because you've got a legacy problem to fix. But if you understand the basis for accounting, you can see how you get from earnings to cash flows. So when you give me the accounting earnings for a company or a project, there are only three things I need to do to get from earnings to cash flows. First, I'm going to add back the depreciation and amortization that showed up as an expense. Why do I do that? Because it's not a cash, you're not writing a check out to DNA, hopefully. I mean, my name is close enough to depreciation. If you're writing out checks, checks to depreciation, I'd willingly change my name, think of the billions I could collect. I add back depreciation and amortization. I subtract out capex. Why? Because even though you don't call it an expense, you have to pay for that land building equipment. It's a cash outflow. And then there's one final adjustment I have to make. Remember what I described accrual accounting as doing? When you sell something on December 30th, I said, even though you haven't been paid for it, you have to show it as revenues this year. When you haven't been paid for something, what shows up on your balance sheet? Or what do you have to show on your balance sheet to reflect that, not, that you haven't been paid? You show receivables. And if you haven't paid for something, you show payables. And if you're using stuff you already bought, it shows up as inventory. Working capital is the residue of accrual accounting. So you know the easy way to fix it is if I want to go from accrual earnings to cash earnings, you take the change in working capital and you subtract it out. So when working capital goes up, that's basically a drain on your cash flows. 
So I know people do this you know, almost routinely, but think about the intuition for why you're doing it. You're adding back depreciation and amortization because of non-cash expense. You're subtracting out CapEx because you have to pay that money anyway, and you're subtracting the change in working capital to come up with the cash flow because you want to make accrual earnings into cash earnings. At the end of that long-winded description, let's cut to the chase. You got earnings, you got cash flows. If the numbers were close to each other, this wouldn't matter that much, right? So the reason we're doing this is because the numbers can be very different. So let's take the extreme scenarios. Can you have a company, or what kind of company would you have when the earnings are a big positive number, but the cash flows are negative? Think about the three adjustments. The answer is to lie there. That is not by itself sufficient because most high capex companies also have high depreciation. So you look at an infrastructure company, they'll have high capex, high depreciation, they'll offset each other. So I'll give you a second chance. It's high capex and low depreciation. You're saying, how does it happen? Remember, depreciation lags capex. If you have a growing company, your capex will grow at a rate higher than the depreciation. So lots of young growth companies will have negative cash flows because the capex is running ahead of the depreciation. You could also have a company that is very slack about how it posts revenues. It sells stuff, it forgets to collect on them for two years, three years, four years. You can post great income, but have horrifically bad cash flows. So earnings can be positive, cash flows can be negative. This is more uncommon, but can you think of scenarios where a company has negative earnings and positive cash flows? I'll give you a clue, there are lots of private businesses in Asia and Latin America, and even in the US, which routinely have this characteristic. And they celebrate. What's the great thing about having losses? You don't pay taxes. I know this is very non-ESG, but kind of set it to the side. You have losses, you don't have to pay taxes. Would you be okay? Everybody thinks you're a loser. But you'd be okay being called a loser if you were able to deposit $5 million of cash in the bank every year. I'll take the label every single year. So you can have losses and big positive cash flows. And what are we saying in finance? When the numbers are different, trust the cash flow. That's really the bottom line. So I'm going to start with that basis you know, and defend why we use cash flows because you can't spend earnings. Try Walk over to the nearest Starbucks. There's one on Broadway, there's one on 6th Avenue. Walk and order a venti cappuccino, whatever your favorite drink is, or a frappuccino. $6.35, offered to pay with earnings. Say, look, I'm going to business school, I have a lot of expected earnings. Even if you have a cashier who believes you, you have to be a really stupid cashier, that's nice, you take the $6.35, I'll take earnings. Cashier's gonna say, that's nice but show me a credit card or show me cash. You cannot spend earnings. Cash is real, earnings is fictional. And if you're ever tempted to go with accounting earnings, I'll tell you a story that might dissuade you from ever doing it. I have about a dozen books now, you know, four different publishers, they all screw me over. The story I'm gonna tell you can apply to any of the publishers. I could show you my contracts in each of these books. It looks incredibly lucrative. I'm entitled like 15% of the net proceeds. If you ever see the word net in a contract, run for the exit door. 15% of the net proceeds. And this is an obscenely overpriced book. I don't know whether any of you have wasted the money of actually buying the applied corporate finance book. But if you did, anybody bought it? I'm glad nobody did. It costs like $130 for a paperback. Who does that? 15% of $130 means I'm making almost $20 every time you buy a book, right? So every six months, I get a royalty statement from my company. So here's what I do. I take the total royalties. They also tell me how many books I sold. I divide by the total number of books to try to figure out how close to $20 I get. You know the most I've ever made in a book? $1.50. There's many a slip. I have no idea how you get from like $20 to $1.50. I've tried. I remember the first time I got the statement, I went through it carefully. 
And I noticed that half my royalties were disappearing for an end of the year adjustment. I said, what the heck is an end of the year adjustment? Did December 31st come up on you unexpectedly? Let me give you a clue. You're in October. December is two months out. And what exactly do you do on December 31st? Take half my books and throw them into the Hudson? So I called the publisher. And you can look up the publisher, but I don't want to name them on video because that will seem like shaming them. And I said, look, you know, I want to talk to somebody about this end of the year adjustment you have because my royalties seem to be disappearing in there. They put me in touch with the legal department. Have any of you guys spent 30 minutes talking with a lawyer? After 30 minutes, you apologize for calling because you have no idea what you called about in the first place. He talked about clauses and subclauses. I go and look at the clause. I have the contract in front of me. He said, look at subclause 7.C. I look at it. It's like half a page long. It talks about an end of the year, but the rest of it is just legal gibberish. So finally, I hung up the phone, and I devised my own petty revenge. And you guys might be the beneficiaries of the petty revenge. Now, with my books, the way I write them is I write them a chapter at a time, and when I'm done, I put a PDF file online, ostensibly to get feedback on typos, because this saves on you know, somebody reading it. So I said, no, I put it online, chapter one, chapter two. My investment valuation book is 35 chapters, chapter one. So I get to chapter 34, chapter 35, I finish the book. I send it off to the publisher, it gets printed, it shows up in bookstores. I forget to take the 35 chapters offline. I remember the first time it happened. The publisher calls me and he says, do you realize you got the entire book online? I said, yes. He said, you also realize you're going to lose sales if you do this. I said, yes, but I'm making a dollar fifty a book. I don't particularly care. If I made $20 a book, maybe I would care more. He hasn't called me back yet. <laughs> okay. So all my books actually are online. The only thing is I can't be too open about this because it'll seem like I'm rubbing their noses in their own contracts. So I've got to give it these strange names. I think for a while I had Mexican menu items names for the different books. So you typed enchilada.com, my corporate finance book came out, burrito.com, you got the, you know. So my suggestion is go through my website looking for menu items. I'll have to keep shifting them. It might be South American food now, it might be Indian food. So it's there. And frankly, when you download it, don't think you're ripping me off. Because at $1.50, it's really not even worth looking at the royalty statement anymore. I just file it away and say, well, that's done. One final story about earnings versus cash flows. You heard of a guy called Winston Groom? He wrote some books. In fact, one of his books you might have heard about, a book called Forrest Gump. It got made into a movie. You know, Tom Hanks started. It became this huge hit. And Winston was actually very, very, you know, when, when Paramount approached him and said, would you like to make a movie? He was, you know, first time anybody wanted to make a movie out of his books. He signed the contract. And the contract entitled him to 5% of the earnings on the movie. First mistake. Second mistake, it also in a footnote said the earnings would be computed using studio accounting standards. Entire, not IFRS and GAP, the studio accounting standards. Second mistake, 30 signed the contract. Big mistake. Movie gets made, not a mistake, because of a huge hit. And poor Winston's at home waiting for the check, and it doesn't come, and it doesn't come, and it doesn't come. And finally, he calls Paramount and says, where's my 5%? They said, 5% of what? The money you're making on this movie. So we're losing money on this movie. So how can you be losing money on a movie with gross gate receipts of, on a, a movie receipts of 300 million? He said, you can come in and look at our books. And he looks in, there's a line item for, that takes away 50% of his revenues. It's like an end of year item in his version. He says, what is that? He said, it's a provision. For what? For future bad movies. Studio accounting actually lets you take the most successful movie revenues and set aside a portion for future bad movies. Now this might explain some things you've been looking at for a long time saying, why is this happening? Remember all those bad Eddie Murphy movies that came out for a while? Where he's a fat woman, uh, he basically was every conceivable variation on himself. 
Maybe this explains it, right? The bad movie provision had become too big, and somebody said, we've got to get Eddie in here to make three bad movies before the end of the year to wipe that provision out. But let me ask you a question. Do you think Paramount made money on the movie? Not the accounting kind, but the actual kind. Absolutely. Is this fair 